All right, so for the record, my name is Christopher Jackson. This is for the regular meeting of Cape Coral Charter School Governing Board. Today is uh, February 13th, 2024. We're at the Oasis Elementary South School Cafeteria at 3415 Oasis Boulevard, Cape Coral, Florida. Time is 5.30 p.m. and I'm calling this meeting to order. All right, so can we first start off with a moment of silence, please? Thank you. And next we are going to have the Pledge of Allegiance and the color guard is going to present for us today. So please rise. You may be seated. All right, may we call the roll? Uh, is this our microphone? That was the microphone or not? Great. Great. And can we have the roll call, please? Atticelli. Present. Jackson. Present. Long, District 6. Here. Michaels. Present. Minaya. Present. Keith. Present. Stout. Present. Paired representatives. Hoagland, OHS. Present. Shade, OMS. Present. Soto, OES. Present. Rizzo, O-E-N. Present. Everybody's called for and present. Thank you. We'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Um, may I get a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion on the approval of the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. That'll bring us to item number six, uh, approval of the agenda, regular meeting. Uh, as it stands, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve uh, agenda, regular meeting is uh, passes. I'm sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Uh, next, that brings us to our public comment. So public comments, um, everybody will have three minutes to speak. Uh, you will address the um, governing board as a whole. Please do not single out any individuals. Uh, please state your name for the record and your affiliation with the school when presenting. Is there anybody else that did not make it onto the um, sign up sheet that would like to speak? You uh, can feel free to go over and see Mrs. Uh, Kathleen, and she will sign you up as well, okay? We do have 45 minutes total for public comment. Who's our first speaker? Joelle 
Joel Guerrero, Angela Wilkinson, Do you want me to put in? Yes, please. Please. Yeah. And please state your name and your affiliation. Do we have a, a timer, Mrs. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angela Wilkinson. I'm with um, OEN. I'm a fifth grade um, interventionist. Uh, I've been with OEN for the last three years. I started as a substitute. Um, my background is education. I started teaching in Broward County in 1993 and left um, because of because of pay is what it was. So here I am standing in front of you 30 years later and it's the same problem. That it's always been a problem, especially in this state of Florida. So um, I went to the budget meeting a couple of weeks ago um, and I was told uh, by Mr. Mason the history of the school. I understand now, in, <laughs> I understand better what has been going on for the last 20 years. I think my concern right now is the budget, um, the allocation of money and teachers and where this money goes. Um, I understand our major funds are our PICA funds and our FEFP fund that is um, allocated to teachers and salaries. Um, my question is, I think we all really want to see the budget of the last five years to see how money is allocated. Um, I know we have two two bills right now in the Senate, that one is an HR bill and one is the Senate bill, and it's pushing for increases in teacher salary. My question to the board is, what are we doing to help push that through? Are we talking to our state representatives? Are we talking to our senators? What are we talking, you know, are we speaking? Are we conversing about this? Because if we have this problem with money, which we've always had problems with money, but the charter school specifically has a huge amount of debt. So I think as teachers, we have to be, we have to really understand the budget, how it's allocated, and how we work um, moving forward. And what do we need? Do we need a lobbyist? Um, Mayor Gunter told me that maybe we do need a, a lobbyist to go to the state and to push for this. So um, any input from the board would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilkerson. And do we have the next speaker, Mrs. Mary Adams? Mary Adams? Yes, I'm here. I don't want to. Um, Amy Ersetti? I'm not taking time. Kim Galt? I teach kindergarten. Do I really need to use the microphone? Okay. Hi, I'm Kim Galt. I'm going to uh, teach kindergarten here at Oasis South. And I wanted to um, talk a little bit about a couple of things that had just been going on, really affecting probably me more than anything else at this point. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, there was a security breach in the division or in our system. Um, where the school was, or the teachers were asked to use a two-factor program process for authenticity. Oh, I can't say the word. You know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I use that too on my personal device for personal business for my banking. Um, so I didn't want to put it on my phone when it came in to the next the next day, and I had several reasons for that. Um, not because I didn't believe in 
uploading it or anything like that, and I'll kind of get to that. Um, what I did find out, as time kind of went on, apparently it was me along with six other employees in the division. I got an email forwarded to me, not meant to me, not addressed to me, that listed all the employees that refused to put this app on their phone and how we were being to, to, to encourage us to load the app on our personal devices to avoid a $25 per person cost to the schools because a FOB would be more difficult to use. On January the 23rd, um, this is when the email came out. In the email, there was no mention of any cost to staff if they did need the FOB. The devices were meant to be ready by the end of the week. They were not. On January the 25th, I had no email available to me. I called the IT help desk. I shared with them that I did not load the Duo app on my phone. They told me that they would come out and get my email going. Todd Wynn is the person that came in my room. He told me there was nothing he could do for me. He could not provide me with a temporary password. I had no way to communicate with staff. My administrators, my team, my parents for over a week. He came in a week later and said, oh, you have no email? Loaded me up right away with a password. On 2-7, I received an email saying that I was going to have to pay for a FOB for $25, okay? That I would have to surrender it if I were to leave this, the system. I would not get my money back. If I lost the FOB, I would have to pay for another one. I was given a FOB. I didn't have to sign anything for it. I was not assigned one. I didn't sign any type of contract when I was given it. So I have kind of a question. And one is about um, in the policy manual, section 8000 operations. I have only one copy if somebody needs one. The part I'm looking at is at the bottom where the superintendent is authorized to develop procedures that would be implemented in the event of an unauthorized release or breach of data. I want to know. Does this imply that anything that is implemented can be a cost to employees? That's my question. Okay. Is it that there are some sort of inferior IT security measures that now is being passed down to the teachers? Who ultimately was responsible for the breach? And are they being held accountable to pay any kind of repara reparations for their conduct? Are we making these rules up we go? Every email says something different to me. So am I going to get an email next week that says, oh, the Ms. cost Hall, of a fob. Excuse me. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Oh, that was too bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. And next speaker on our list. That's the list. That's the list. Is there anybody else wishing to speak? We would love to hear from you. Please don't hesitate or we're okay. okay. Thank you for uh, speaking tonight. We do appreciate it. I'm going to open it up to uh, board comment about citizens input. Is there anybody wishing to speak on citizens input on the board? Please. I believe that the budgets are public. Because I'm not sure where past ones can be found, but I believe they're all public information. Is that right? They are public. Is there a, an easy place for those to be found? Right now, they can be all be found on your, your website. Back, going back five years? I believe that there is five okay. years of budget. Okay. Time. So those are public and can be found on the website. Um, so if anyone is interested in looking at those, that's, right. that's where they are located. Yep. Um, and I know that in the past we have talked about the possibility of leveraging the um, city's lobbyists or lobbyists for. For any you know, any activity putting forth to the legislature that interests the school, um, so I'm not sure if that's still a possibility, but that might be something that we look into. I think that came up in our full meeting. Can I add one extra point about the, the budget? Our first budget workshop is in April, and it will be um, in the evening, I believe, Kathleen. Um, Mark, you said you can't get here. You can't get here. Thank you. Um, I think what we tried to do is orchestrate them at the time when we would have our normal governing board meeting, which is the evening, so if anybody can attend. Um, budget workshops are open for all employees to attend if you wish, but usually they're during the day at 9 o'clock. So, like we 
did last year. This year we're going to have them right before this meeting in the afternoon so anybody can attend. I would like to sit in and listen to the process. Please. I guess I'll follow one up first before I get into my, my points. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Are those available? Uh, is there recordings of those available as well? They're not able to attend those meetings for the budget workshop? Yes. There's a recording as well as on the website. The um, reports go back eight years. So it's not they, live streaming, but it's I understand. Yeah, just so everyone can kind of be informed if they're not able to make it to that event. Um, I appreciate everyone for speaking uh, from the public. So two points. One is on the budget. Uh, Ms. Wilkerson spoke, or I actually spoke at the event, um, and we discussed about a couple different ways that, that you guys can kind of make your voices heard with regards to the budget. I think uh, starting with your state representatives, especially since they're the ones that are immediately involved in the allocation of those funds, is critical. Uh, so continue to reach out to them and, and, uh, and discuss with them. Um, what we've done is, so far, the majority of our staff has done with the three out. We had a, a security breach. Um, it is virtually impossible to know who was responsible. It was widespread. We had at least 100 people that had to um, go in and redo their, their, their passwords. Um, we've had them recently, um, and they've been significant. So we followed the city's protocol, which is to go to the Duo app, which is the two-step authentication, so that um, we can verify who's logging in. Um, we had everybody in the system, with the exception of just a few that felt comfortable downloading the app. Um, <clears throat> the problem is that we did not budget for FOBs because we have access to the free app. So after discussions with um, the city finance department and IT, um, we purchased apps. We purchased, um, we purchased 20 apps. We purchased um, some that if they were lost, we could replace them. But the cost to us is $25 per app. Bob, and Bob, Bob, Bob. A FOB. And um, we did not budget for those. And if we, uh, we were afraid that if we said, you have a choice between a FOB for $25 or the app, we, we could significantly have had a majority of our staff ask for a FOB. And we didn't budget for that expense. That expense could be upwards of seven to $10,000. So after uh, discussing this with finance, we will bill to teachers for the FOB, and we will be um, billed from the city's IT department, and we will wire that cost back to the city IT department. So that is um, the way we set it up, not knowing that what to expect, and we were afraid that we would have a, a large request for FOB that we uh, were not able to um, accommodate. <coughs> We don't really want to be in the FOB business where you have to replace it, you have to find it. it, it we don't have the staff to, to monitor and, and to handle that kind of component. Um, it's a more complicated process because every time you log in, you've got to press your FOB button and get a number. The, um, the, the free app is every 14 days you have to authenticate. It just makes more sense for us and for our system financially to uh, not support an app process. So if we have a couple people, two or three, that wanted to purchase an app, they can. Um, and if they lose it, they can either contact IT or they can renew their FOB. Um, that is the cost of the actual product that we're assuming. If we, the board wants to talk about it in the next budget season and budget, um, $10,000 for FOB usage, I don't, I, I don't agree with that, um, but we can certainly talk about it moving forward, but it's not within our budget process this year anticipate this um, to happen. Sure. Thanks for that. I, yeah, I guess I, I understand the need, obviously, and the urgency of it. Uh, my only concern, I guess, is what you had in your words, you know, if you didn't want to be in the FOB business. And so I understand uh, the, the staff also didn't want to be in the FOB business, right? So I respect their, their right to uh, opt out of that, but I also respect their own administrative position. What it means if you start handing out those and obviously what that would attribute into. So, uh, you know, I don't know whether this is desired for the board, but I think uh, having that discussion about maybe subsidizing that to some extent or minimizing that cost or bearing a certain portion of that for those that do choose to 
opt in and still uh, on that basis, um, I'd be willing to entertain that. But um, what's our exposure presently based on those who opted out? Like, how much would it cost? How much do the 25 times however many people opted out cost us now? So far, system wide, we've had two people that have decided to go for a fob versus the app. Okay, so that's two people. That's so, two people because because of the approach. Oh, of course. If I didn't have the, the fee component, it could be two hundred people. No, no, understood. But we're just I'm just looking at what's the present situation. So a kind request might be that our foundation could consider some kind of a minimal grant for those that were affected this year, and we we will see what next year looks like. But that's just a kind request because we do have a a, a foundation mechanism. And I think what we're going to talk a little bit about later today is what are our other gaps in terms of we can't solve for you know statewide salary issues, but what are some other gaps that whether the foundation solves for it or we find another solution to solve for it, we can do that until we have a, a longer term solution, right? So that was just a kind of question. Uh, and, and again, salary is is a huge issue as we as we know, and, and I think our our board has been continuing to wrestle with how can we further those uh, gaps, it, how can we close those gaps. Um, and um, there's uh, some, some activity underway at the county level. Uh, there's some activity underway, you know, unfortunately three to five years from now when we'll be able to vote on the sales tax referendum that would include charter schools as it should have. Um, but, but we need to solve for the shorter term, and, and I'm sure we're going to discuss that a little bit from a strategic plan perspective. Great input. Thank you. Sure. I Mr. agree with, with Dr. Manai. If there's a way to creatively problem solve for the, the couple, you know, if it ends up being 50 or $100, if the foundation can figure out a solution to that, I'm a big believer in problem solving. And the other thing that I would recommend is if we can do a survey uh, at some point to ask people in the future for, to budget for next year, say, if you have a choice between the fob and the phone. I, I feel like the vast majority of people are going to say they have they want the phone. If it ends up being ten or twenty people, then maybe we can consider budgeting for that. Great insight. Thank you. Any other members? Um, as far as the fob goes, um, it, they are a little antiquated. They're becoming obsolete. You know, people lose them. Uh, everybody always has their phone on them, so they never lose that. But I do understand if you don't want to put it on your own personal phone. Um, so yes, hopefully uh, we do have the solution. Maybe the foundation is a solution. Maybe it's something else. But um, if it's only two or three, I think that we can probably find a, a stopgap, a short-term one. Um, and then, as stated, it's not in our budget. So if we do have more than five or ten teachers that would like this FOB, um, we can't just change the budget. That's something that's already set in stone that we have to vote on for next year's process. And that's something we can always consider that. Um, as far as teacher pay goes, um, yeah, that's a struggle in the state. I don't think there's a school in the state of Florida or in the United States that doesn't think their teachers should be paid more. Um, as you know, as a charter school, we don't receive the same funding as the county schools get. Um, we get about 70 cents on the dollar. So we're working with significantly less, but we're producing vastly more than they are. So, um, and that's in turn to the teachers, I believe. So we do thank you for that. And I know, you know, we, we understand, we see why our school is doing so well. Um, I think Jackie's going to talk a little bit later about some of these compensations that we've been trying to discuss and come up with uh, strategic solutions for it, along with our finance director, Mr. Mason, as well. Um, so, you know, when she speaks on that, hopefully that'll bring some more to light for you. Um, I believe it is um, in the... They're asking in the budget this year for, to increase teacher pay. Um, of course, we won't know until the budgetary process is over. We still have about three more months on that. And then we'll have a clearer picture of what the starting pay for teachers might end up being. It might not change, but it looks like it's heading in the direction that it probably will. Um, for um, the moment, like I said, we've, we've tried to come up with solutions to um, make up that, that gap in the um, <clears throat> as far as lobbyists go, um, 
we are a charter school and we belong to charter organizations that do actually lobby for us. Um, we pay dues to them, they go to the state and they lobby for us. So we are being heard. Is it as strong as we'd like? Probably not, but um, we are also trying to utilize the city's lobbyists uh, more. So that's a negotiation, so we're trying to figure out. Unfortunately, a lot of the lobbyists that the city has, they have a very specific wheelhouse that they work under, right? It might be under public safety, it might be. So there's not one that's just for education, right? So we're trying to discuss that with the city manager and um, try to figure out how we can best utilize maybe some of their lobbyists as well. Okay. Thank you so much for your input, it is always appreciated. Any more public input? The non-public input is now closed. That brings us to our consent agenda. Um, is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Is there any, Jack, would you like to speak on anything on the consent agenda before we vote on it? Does anybody have anything they, they would like clarification on? Actually, I do. Is there anybody else that has any questions? Uh, my question is on section B. Um, it states the meeting dates. Um, we had changed August 13th to August 20th. I wanted to make sure that that was correct because I believe that's the third week of the month. So was that intended? In June. In August. 20th, 2024 we have? We start late in August because of the first day of school. The first day of school will fall on the second day of school. It's, it's just it's very busy. There's a lot of... A lot going okay, on. so we, we, so we intentionally did push it yes. to the third week. Yeah. Perfect. That was my only question on that. So. Any other comments or anything we'd like to talk about in the consent? Yeah, no, please. What we um, uh, in the school calendar, and I saw that it was in both ours, I think it's a little more identical, um, there was some reference to something, it was in my February, that says six days prior. I had no idea what the reference was. Do you know what that is? Can you, I just don't have it up in front of me. Can you read it off? <coughs> this is about the actual calendar the for the calendar. school year? Yep. We have six consecutive days for the year. Oh, that's the FTE week. That is, um, it's a survey period where <coughs> we do a count, a student count. We find out how many students we have and that student count generates our payment for students. Um, during the third survey portion. So that really shouldn't be on there. That's it was on both. And I was like, I don't know what It's pretty much for information specialists because it's their job to do a student head count. So we get paid appropriately based on enrollment. Do we have a motion to pass the consent agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to our superintendent report. Mrs. Collins, please. Okay, Jackie Collins, superintendent report. Uh, a couple things to talk about. I'm going to start with facilities. We've got some great news. Um, we've been working very closely with the facilities department of the city. We've got uh, our friend Terry Schweitzer over here. He's been our, our, con our interim uh, contact person, and we've gotten quite a bit done, along with Terry and Chris Camp, who uh, is also one of our um, engineers for the city. Um, so the good news is that Oasis Elementary and Oasis South are both going to be recarpeted over the summer. Ooh, principals, I know, we should probably clap for that. <laughs> We've been waiting for you know, 17 years. So uh, the price tag is rather high. Um, but it is, we did have to move both uh, elementary schools into this year's budget. Principals picked out colors. Don't get real excited about them because you have to hide stains for probably another 15 years. Uh, but we're really making some good progress. Uh, we're getting the uh, painting done, the high school uh, gym lobbies, the high school lobby. 
um, uh, of the gym. They'll be painted. Um, so we've got a lot of great things that are happening, and as they're happening, um, city, the city facilities department is letting us know. So we can expect some really nice changes over the, over the course of this summer. Carpeting is a really big project. Might not be finished over the summer months. We might have to extend into weekends or um, Thanksgiving break, just depending on how fast that project goes. But one of those big landmark hurdles that we tried for a long time to have happen is finally happening. So we're very happy about that. We're going to meet with Parks and Rec, and we're also going to meet with Custodial. Um, because when we do big projects like that, it upsets uh, what we have going on in the summertime. We have the summer camps. We have uh, several hundred students here in our building. So we have to juggle our students and what rooms they can use with our custodial cleaning um, schedule because we strip all the floors, re wax the floors in all the common areas. Uh, the carpets will be redone. Uh, the gym floor at Oasis Middle School is going to be resurfaced. That means stripped, sanded, repainted, as well as the Oasis High School gym floor. Now those haven't been done since they were opened. So those are also big, lengthy projects as well. So you'll see some, some really unique things happening this summer. Um, but it's going to take some coordination, and that's going to be coming up on our plans um, in the near future. Let's see. Budget. The budget process is currently in full swing. The principals have submitted their staffing and operation budgets to finance. The review is going to be scheduled the last week of March with me. Once the principals get all their figures in, I mean, we talk about it constantly. We've been talking about this since early December. We're getting those figures in. We're getting our staffing levels in. We're thinking about what we need and how much prices are going to increase from last year to this year. Not only do, do we plan for 2025, we plan up out to 2027. So it's a lot of work, a lot of line. We have some ridiculous amount of lines in our budget. <clears throat> um, and it does take quite a while to, to, to finalize that. So I'll be meeting with the principals and Cassandra, our budget analyst, in March. And then the week of March 4th through 8th, it, she is scheduled to sit down with the director of finance to review the numbers, make sure everything budgets. And then we should be prepared for our, um, our scheduled budget workshop on April 9th, which will be held right before our 530 meeting. Um, and everyone is invited that is open to the public. If you want to come to a budget workshop, I highly suggest that you do. And you can see the money that we bring in and how it's allocated. Um, because we, you know, we, we have a skeletal budget. And we allocate as best we can. And it's good for everybody to see and experience that process. Uh, we don't foresee any major changes to the budget in FY25. We are uh, we're, we're adjusting food prices as a biggie. Uh, gasoline prices is the, the things that are always the biggies we, you know, we are, are adjusting for electric bills and things like that, but nothing major in that process to date. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk about House Bill 733. It is approaching. This House Bill has to do with um, changing the start times of secondary education in the state of Florida. That means the bill states that high schools cannot start before 8.30 a.m. Middle schools cannot start before 8 a.m. We need to start thinking about this now. We need to start thinking if, you know, we, we, start, we need to start analyzing to see if there's a budget impact for us. Remember, our um, start times are pretty much tied to bus schedules. Our bus drivers do two routes in the morning and at least two in the afternoon. So if you're driving students to Oasis North, you're also driving students to Oasis High School. The same bus driver is doing those two routes. And what we're finding is that we need time in between start times, a minimum of an hour and 15 minutes before we can start the next school time. So I have something here that I'm going to show everyone. It is just a very rough idea. Yeah. I can't do two things. <laughs> Mary Beth, do I have to sign it again? Sometimes we have problems with our screen going in and out here. So 
let me just give you an idea of what we're thinking about as possible start times. Let me know what it comes um, One potential idea is that we start both elementary schools at 7.45 a.m. Apparently, Oasis North starts at 8.15. Oasis South, they're, they're perfect. Oasis South starts at 8.30. Okay, so if you want to take a look at the screen, if Oasis South starts at 8.45, that means we need at least an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half between that next run that follows suit after uh, Oasis Elementary School. However, I want you to look down at Oasis North and the high school first, because this is really where the times are um, dependent on those buses being able to complete their routes. If OEM starts at 7.45, that means the buses can start picking up students at 6.15 in the morning, and yes, it's dark. They will finish their route by 7.15, 7.30 or so, or they will arrive at the school, and can be ready to start another bus run for the high school at 7.45. So that would mean the earliest the high school could start would be 9.15 a.m. Now that's, you know, it's complicated because when you think about high school, you think about all the athletics. It happens at the end of the day. Team sports, games, they start sometimes as early as 2 o'clock. We're shipping kids out to go to Moorhaven, to go other places, <clears throat> Everglades City. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, they will start at 9.15. They will end their day at 3.45. If Oasis starts at 7.45, we've got a little more time to get the middle school up and running. The middle school won't be able to start any earlier than 9.45. Now that's typical for um, middle schools in Lee County. They tend to start at 9.50. Um, <clears throat> but in order to, and they'll, their dismissal time will be 9, excuse me, will be 4.15. What we had to do to prevent a financial impact at this stage of the game is shorten the school day at the elementary schools to a six and a half hour day from seven. That would put all teachers work days on the same playing field all schools will work and run six and a half days for students. Six and a half hours a day for students. Now, of course, staff reports 30 minutes early and stays 30 minutes later. But this is one of the plans that we thought would make the most sense um, based on our busing situation, based on what we know. This is very tentative. We're still getting the feel. I don't want to start any later because then we'll have students getting home in the dark at night as well. It's really not a win-win situation, unfortunately. It's gonna be a lot of change and adjustment for the secondary students. Uh, I know that the American Association of Pediatrics says that high school students need more sleep and they need to sleep in, but when they're at their football game until 11 o'clock at night, on a Thursday night, they're gonna get up late the next, day. they're gonna to wanna to sleep in the next day. So it's all, you know, it's all relative. So these are just our, temp, our, our tentative ideas, but we need to start talking about them. Um, and furthermore, what this also brings on our plate is the fact that the littles will be getting out at 2.30. The high school students and the middle school students who sometimes take care of their younger siblings, while the parents are at work at the end of the day and pick them up at the bus stop, they'll still be in school. So this is gonna cause the elementaries to have to take a good look at their before and after care programs because we are going to see a significant rise in attendance in those programs. What Lee County Schools do is they run their own before and after care programs. Um, they get to um, keep the funds that these programs raise. We went to Gulf Elementary. They have almost 450 families, students that participate in the after school program. They do bring in uh, several hundred thousand dollars, 150 to 200, she said at the end of the year, revenue, which would be great. Um, <clears throat> but it is a lot of work. And so we have to think about, is this something that we want to do? It would prevent uh, injuries. It would prevent um, um, high school students from supervising our students. And we, we, we have some issues with Parks and Rec as it's run now. We would like to take this over and have our Parks and Rec department run by our staff. We would come up with a pay schedule for staff. Um, not sure what that would be yet, um, but we would offer things like homework time. We could offer um, STEM and art classes. Um, I think it would be beneficial to our system in order to do this. This is a huge undertaking that we 
and the finance department are looking into as far as how does the county do it, how do they pay everybody, um, and uh, sorry, <laughs> and what kind of responsibilities the school is going to be taking on. So we're working with the county. Uh, we're going to work with Mark Mason, and we're going to work with Lee County's um, accounting office to find out how it's done. So, <clears throat> and what we if we if we're going to take this this program over. We'd like to do it sooner rather than later. We don't want to wait until 2026 when we have all these other issues with start times and buses, and we could be wrong about our predictions. We need to start next year. So our goal is to start our own before and after care program next year. Um, we're gonna have to hustle and get our ducks in a row. Um, and then we'll reach out to our staff to see who is interested in, in actually working on before and after care program, and some might be, um, but it takes a lot of planning. So. Um, this is something that's coming down the pike and we wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of what we are looking forward to in the near future. Dr. Manai? Surely. Yeah. The, I mean, this impacts all charters, public charters in the state of Florida? This impacts all schools, secondary schools in the state of Florida, public schools. And, and has our association been vocal on what this means from an impact perspective to charters? Or charter association? Or? Nothing's really been said about it. I think what we're, they're hoping is that there's a waiver system where you can opt out. I haven't heard anything about that yet. Um, and maybe it's something that won't actually happen. Uh, according to Jackie Corey, she said it's happened before, back in the early 2000s, and it was a nightmare. And they, then they switched right out of that the following year. Right. So we don't, we don't, it, we don't know what's happening right. yet. There are so many different sized charters, right? And it'd be interesting that that requirement is on all charters regardless of size and the smaller the charter the more Difficult. challenging it is so yes. yes it'll be interesting to see how that plays out so for we're being proactive we're getting ahead of the game if this really truly is going to happen we need to be ready because it's a lot yeah. it's a lot of work for us and as i find oh. out more information i will let you know yes. um and i know you're just still trying to sort of get everything figured out but in terms of sort of pricing, because this seems like, especially on the elementary level, a lot of parents would may more than are already using the aftercare may have to rely on that. Do we have any idea of what, are we going to be comparable to absolutely to what to yeah. what you get you're paying for the parks and rec or we're thinking it might end up being a little bit more since you're going to have to rely on uh, staff possibly. Mary Beth, do you remember the price comparison? It, it's it's very much the same it isn't it? Is. Our goal is to keep it reasonable because there is there will be a need. And typically Parks and Rec offers scholarships. We'll do the same for those families that really need the assistance. So all of that has to be worked out. John? Just to clarify, I know you said the year um, at least once, but for the teachers and the parents in the audience, this, <coughs> this House bill goes into effect in the 2026-27 school year. So there's still a couple of legislative sessions. There's right. going to be a ton of lobbying. Speaking of lobbyists, this affects every public school and so uh, even the school district of Lee County is probably going to fight against this with their lobbyists <laughs> so I have a feeling there's a fair chance there will be some changes to this but it's not going to affect until 26 27 but we have to be proactive with thinking about it and, and planning ahead um, just in case if this ridiculousness gets overturned and changed back to the way it should be it's just so frustrating it's like nobody cares that the elementary school has to get up early now um, I mean, like it's just like legislatures making a decision without thinking it through. Um, are we, if this doesn't happen, will we still be looking at maybe taking the after school care into yes. our own? For the I long think term? it's best for our system and for our parents and families that we run the program, that we staff it with um, trained individuals, not necessarily high school students. Uh, we, we we tend to have. More frequently than not, issues with supervision, um, teenagers on their cell phones, we've had injuries at the playground level, uh, we would feel more comfortable taking it over because we know our students and we know how to manage them appropriately. And I think the parents would appreciate that as well. We've been talking about this for years, really, pretty much. We just have never been in a position to really do it, but now we feel it's probably the best time. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad idea about the high school students, especially they need that if there are programs that we can 
you know, um, manage in our facilities and have the older children watch their younger children in a school activity. We that's do. We that's do. something that, yes. but we could do more of it, like doing community hours to our students and giving it back in mm -hmm. another way Absolutely. so it would be cost effective. Mm -hmm. So it's Indeed. just something to think about. Mm -hmm. All right, I just have two more things I'd like to share before my report is over. Um, <clears throat> as part of our strategic plan goal number two, recruitment and retention, I am delighted to say that um, Dr. Owenson applied for a grant with the Smithsonian Institution recently, and our application was accepted. So um, the, the grant involves assistance with hiring, um, hi hiring diversified teachers in the field of STEM. Now, um, we're looking for teachers in any field. But when you think about elementary teachers, they're engaged in science, teaching science and STEM. Middle school and high school as well. Those, those tend to be the most difficult positions to fill. Science, high, high level science, physics, algebra, chemistry, we just can't find the people. So we're hoping that um, this is an all expense paid grant. We're taking an HR team to uh, Washington DC Two weekends from now, I've got our HR manager coming with us, Dr. Owenson, a STEM teacher, myself, and our public information officer uh, and marketing chairperson, uh, Kathleen. Our goal is to go. We're going to be assigned a mentor for the, for, over the period of a year. We're going to de design a plan based on data, based on what we're able to do to recruit diversified teachers into our school system that generally reflect our population because our population is um, overwhelmingly um, female and Caucasian. So we're looking for um, more of a, of a Hispanic representation because we do have about 25 to 35% of our population is Hispanic. And of course, research clearly demonstrates that students that can identify with their, with their um, person of um, racial ethnicity, they tend to learn better. Um, and so we'll, we're, we're going to see what we can come up with. So the data that we collect over the period of the course of this year for this grant, uh, we will have to turn into this research project. Um, but we're hoping if, if we can get two, two teachers that can teach a STEM course for us, we've met our goal. If we can recruit one teacher, because right now, when you when we have these science teacher um, you know positions you know uh, on our website. We got zero hits. Donnie's had a science teacher position posted eighth grade for I don't know how many months. We can't get anybody to apply. So this is times for desperation, but this happened to fall into our lap, and um, we're very excited about this, and we will keep you posted on what our plan is when we return, because the goal of this three intensive day um, summit is that we come up with a plan to present to you that will work for us. And then also, um, we have something else in the works for strategic plan goal number one, student development, student achievement, which is developing an innovative and curricular platform and innovative teacher practices. Um, we're going to do two things. First, our, admin, our administrative staff is going to attend a Learning in the Brain conference in New York City at the end of April. It's a very interesting conference because what it's going to do is it's going to teach us how to educate students um, of the future. We're not talking about Generation X anymore, that would be me. We're not talking about Generation Z necessarily. Uh, we're talking about Generation Alpha. These are students that have been born into the digital age. They don't know anything but technology. How are they learning? Um, what are their uh, psychological mindsets towards learning? Because if, if you're out there trying to hire people in any kind of profession, um, it's hard to find people that want to work. They, they, they balance lifestyle differently than when I was a kid. You, you went to school, you made money, you worked a 60 plus hour week, and you provided for your family. This, the, the youth of today, they want a little laid back perspective. They want quality family time. They want time off. Um, but they want to be compensated accordingly. So we have to understand who are we trying to find and, and hire? And how are their brains working in this digital world? Because they're going to be exposed to all sorts of types of AI that will be a part of their curriculum, and we need to know how to incorporate the digital age into what we're teaching. Did I say that correctly? 
most of the presenters are, are uh, based at their professors um, with a neuroscience background. Um, and I'll quote from the brochure that we're attending. It's what does innovating for the future currently look like? Understanding psychological flexibility and of course fostering um, critical thinking and comprehension. We need to learn how Generation Z and Alpha, which is 2010 to 2020, the largest generation on the planet, um, how are they going to connect to the world? And their interpersonal skills will be the key. Because what we find is that those interpersonal skills are lacking for these future um, students. Anybody have any questions about that? Each principal will come back with a takeaway and present to the board their takeaway so that we can understand how to move what we've learned um, into the future. Are we taking a teacher with us to this one? We are. So we're taking one principal and one teacher to attend this workshop uh, in New York City. This is being paid for by Title II. Esther, am I right? Yeah, Title II. And additionally, as another component of our strategic goal, we are going to visit tomorrow an avid showcase school called Rampello Downtown Partnership Magnet School. It's a school very much like ours in size, demographic. Um, it's also an A school. But what we're going to go see is the initiative. So it's, it's an avid initiative, which is aimed at promoting college and career readiness for all students. The major, vast majority of our students at high school, they're college and career ready and minded. But there is a group of about maybe 25% that we are missing. And we want, to, we, we, we want to be able to target all students to give them the opportunity to be college and career ready. Uh, and we want to do this. We want to start this initiative in kindergarten so that they are learning the same kinds of learning skills and strategies, K all the way through 12. Just like our STEM program, which is very effective, K all the way through 12, so that when they get to middle school and high school, they already know what a Socratic seminar is. They know how to take Carnegie notes. They know these things. Um, <clears throat> the added platform is uh, basically focused on um, instruction, systems, leadership, and developing a culture for learning. Um, <clears throat> And we think that, so basically what we're gonna go do is we're gonna go take a look at what this average showcase school looks like. What are components do we see that we like? What do we think we could take away from that and instill in our system? Because our goal is to come up with innovative and strategic instructional practices to engage our students. Um, if we like what we see, there's additional AVID training that we might participate in over the summer. And then if, if that was the case, we would take a handful of teachers. Um, and, and take them with us to see AVID training. Take them to K Kagan training, which is a component of the collaboration aspect of the AVID platform. We're gonna learn more about it. Jackie Corey really knows a little bit about AVID because she's, she was an AVID school. She was a district leadership trainer for AVID. The rest of us don't really know what to expect. So we're gonna go tomorrow and see the school. Uh, we're gonna leave about four o'clock in the morning. It's really six o'clock, but it's four o'clock for me. Um, and we're going to be there for the day and see what, what it is to see and see if there are any takeaways. And then we'll come back to the board and we'll report. Do we like what we see? And do the, these systems in place, um, do they apply to us? Maybe they don't, but maybe there are some that do. So we're, going to, we're trying to create our platform for innovational learning now, and we're trying to create a three to five year plan. Because what we've been finding <clears throat> is that we find things that come along, we try to implement it, it's a here and there kind of thing. Teachers either like it or they don't. Half implement it, some don't because it doesn't apply to them, they already know it. We're tired of trying to nitpick different things to introduce to our teachers. We wanna find something that works K through 12 that everybody can buy into and say, yeah, this is really what's gonna work for us. Because nitpicking things here and there and here and there doesn't seem to work. And also we've got this uh, Marzano platform that we've been implementing for quite a while. This ties into Marzano, but makes it easier for our teachers to address the Marzano standards. Because Marzano is complex, deep, and layered, and we're finding that it's quite a bit for our staff to undertake. So, I said enough. Uh, when we get back, we'll explain in better detail what we're experiencing, but I want to let you know that we are already thinking ahead 
um, in these areas, um, and that's important because these are going to take time and energy to implement. That's all I have. Any questions? Dr. Manai. Is the strategic plan been published, or how would you characterize that? We're, on the, we're in the process of publishing that. What we do in, in February typically is a State of the Schools address where we review the strategies that um, the committee implemented and we assign committees. We just haven't gotten to that point yet, but we're, we're inching there. We just don't want to let these opportunities go because they're coming up faster than we are able to handle them. So in the month of March, we'll do a State of the Schools address where we will share that and publish that for you so you can see how we finalized what the original committee agreed upon. Great. Yeah, and for, for whatever it's worth, the, with, we, we completed our strategic plan for the Horizon Council. We're um, now inputting that into a, uh, it's called Mission Met application where anyone can see what progress you're making at any time. Right? Yes. So it's, so the, do we have something like That's that? That's our intention That's to do that. So, so it'll be visible in a platform kind of a approach. And we're hoping so, with the help okay. of, of IT. Sure. What, what we found was that the, the, the strategic planning meeting was good, but it gave us a lot of checklist items. I don't want checklist items. We need measurable goals. So it's taken a lot of transforming what we've collected to put them into measurable goals, and we're in the process of doing that. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, let's go board discussion. I do have a couple things, Jackie. Um, as far as the budget workshop goes, um, it's been suggested to me that we try to get city council to be a little bit more involved in our budgeting. Um, so, Keith, uh, I would really appreciate if maybe at the next council meeting you could um, let council know that they're invited to please come to our workshops. Um, I know that um, at the end of the day, you guys approved the budget, but you know, all the minutiae and the logistics of it um, are stuff that get hammered out before it comes to you guys. So if there's any interest at all in any of the council members coming, we would love to have it. Uh, I think if they see the, some of the logistics of where we're coming from, that, um, I think it would make them more enlightened on our school system and be beneficial. So that would be great if you could pass that along at the next meeting. Um, as far as the start times go, um, I know that we talked about, it may not happen, it may happen. I think that it's very smart in getting in front of this. I think um, forming a committee probably sometime soon to come up with all the what ifs and the things that we're not really thinking about would be a, a great idea. Uh, I think we need to collaborate with Lee County, see how they're planning on implementing this as well. Uh, we have some great ties already with um, their school board, so that would be an easy process. And I'm sure they'd be happy to fill us in on what they're doing as well. I know theirs looks a little bit different than ours as well, but uh, we can definitely get some pointers from them. Um, as far as taking over the before and after school programs, um, has it been proposed that maybe Park and Rec no longer wants to run this program? Or is this something <coughs> that they don't want to park. They handed it to us with glee. <laughs> I kind of figured they would have. So it, it, it's one of the harder parks and rec programs probably that are offered. Um, it, it's very difficult. And yes, the, the caliber, caliber of people that we get are going to be those teenagers. And uh, if we can make more out of the parks and rec rather than them just running wild and I mean, there's a time and a place for that as well. We do want to have some fun, but if we could maybe make more of it and have some study time, have some professional teachers that are doing this, uh, it would also maybe incentivize teachers um, to work it and maybe get a little bit more pay. I mean, I don't know if that's something they're interested in, but it's an opportunity for the teachers, right? And we can give them the opportunity for it. So that could also maybe put a stop gap to some of the, the pay that they receive. Um, as far as the grant goes for the STEM program, um, are we looking for bilingual teachers in the Hispanic community that we're trying to suss out? And is there a need for bilingual teachers in our school? Uh, I think that, yes. I think they're significantly, we're finding that we have more and more ESL students that are enrolling than, than even the ESE. Um, so it would, be, it would be key if we could find those that are bilingual. I think that would be a great target for teachers for sure. 
that that's the demographics that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> I think it's great that we're being proactive and teaching the new generation. Right? Uh, they don't learn the same way. They have different skill sets. They're different. The way they think is different than the way we do. Um, sticking with an old model, just constantly doing it, is it, not progress. It's not where we need to be. So I'm glad we're being proactive in finding out how to teach these new students and, and their set. Thank you for your report. That's great. All right. That brings us to city manager's report and the finance report from Mr. Mark Mason. Nothing to that? Nothing to that. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but we'll take it. Well, I was going to talk about the, uh, the carpeting, but she already took over. So. Yeah, she stole the thunder. Stole it all. There you go. <laughs> we need that carpeting that they put in the casino so you can't see anything. <laughs> wow. All right, that brings us to the chairman's report. I've got a few things on my report today, so bear with me. Um, I want to start off by saying that I attended the OE and Robotics competition. Uh, that was so much fun, seeing all of these kids just smiling faces. They were excited about learning. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen kids so excited about uh, learning, and they might not even know that they were learning, right? And that's the whole point of it, right? It was more play. It was more... But you could see the gear in their head turning, like, how am I going to maneuver this? How can I build this better? It, it was exceptional. Uh, seeing them, there was a lot of parent involvement there as well. It was a lot of fun to witness. Um, so thank you for hosting that, Ms. Grafstick, as well. Um, it, it went off without a hitch. It was great. And um, it, now that we have these maker spaces, and we're going to be vertically aligned, which is going to be right up your alley as well, through K through 12, now these kids are going to go into the middle school, um, and they're not going to be starting from scratch anymore. They're going to already know how to build these robots. They're already going to know how to... They're going to know what coding is, maybe not how to do it, but they're going to understand the fundamentals, right? So I think that's one of the greatest things we've done for our school is aligning this in the old school, right? Because that is the future. It's in the stem, so. <clears throat> As you all know, um, I have invited the Youth Council to come shadow us at our next meeting. So they're actually going to sit on the dais with us. Um, hopefully there's enough for them where we can pair everybody up. Hopefully there's enough for Tracy up with kids. They won't have that much, but... Um, a, a lot of the youth council also stated that one of the things they wanted to discuss during our meeting was school safety. It seemed to be top of mind for them, right? So I procured uh, the chief, Cape Coral chief of police, to come give a presentation on that day as well so that he can answer a lot of the questions that the kids might have and also that board and parents might have for him as well. So I look forward to everybody showing up. Teachers, everybody, please come. Uh, I think that the youth council would really appreciate the attendance as well. Um, I would like to congratulate Dr. Manaya. He has been appointed chair of the Horizon Council. And that is a really big deal. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, uh, a great um, get together. There was a lot of dignitaries there. There was uh, the who's who. It was, it was really neat to see. I think that it's going to allow Dr. Manaya to give us a lot of insight as to what the county is doing and what the county is thinking on a bigger scale, and uh, you know that can have some impact on us as well. So we do appreciate it. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, we're going to talk about our bylaws. We're going to call this the more you know session. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this was kind of a brainchild of uh, Kathleen Paul Evans as well. Um, this is something we probably should have implemented a long time ago because um, a lot of people, they sit on the board, but they don't know necessarily what our bylaws, what our mission is, what we're supposed to be doing up here, right? We kind of, uh, we're not as, as informed as maybe we should be. And I'm sure plenty of us have taken it upon ourselves to read the bylaws, but we're going to suss out a few each and every month. And during the chairman's report, we're just going to go over them a little bit and talk about what they entail. So I know in the agenda she sent out, um, we have a copy of the bylaws that we were going to discuss today. So I'd like to open that up for anybody who would like to discuss any of the bylaws that were presented to us today in a small bite-sized chunk. Any comments or concerns or recommendations? 
I actually highlighted a couple of things that I think were important. Some of them are, are very common sense. They're one-liners that kind of say what we need to know, right? Um, I think um, 0123, standards for board members, ethics, and boardmanship. Um, I think that A encompasses everything we kind of need to know what we are as a board, uh, what our mission is, what our goal is, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So it says, remember that the first, first, and greatest concern must be the educational welfare of all students attending the charter public schools, regardless of ability, race, creed, sex, or socioeconomic status. So that's the first thing we're tasked with. That is an enormous thing that we're tasked with, right? <laughs> it's the greatest concern that this board should be comprised with is the students. That is our number one goal. So if we keep that, you know, in the forefront of our minds and we use that to guide our decisions, we're going to do great with the board and we're going to be well informed, right? Um, I think that uh, D needs to be discussed a little bit. We recognize that an individual board member, there is, they don't have any authority to speak or act for the board. We all have opinions. We all have, they may vary at times, but uh, at the end of the day, we need to speak as one. We need to speak as a board. So we may vote on things and not everybody agrees, but what our bylaws tell us is that after it's voted on, we get behind it and we accept it, we appreciate it, and uh, we're in unison, right? Um, <clears throat> number G says, render all decisions based on the available facts and independent judgments rather than succumbing to the influences of individuals or special interests. Right? That's a big thing in politics now. In politics are kind of seeping into school boards. They're influencing a lot of what we do, but we need to make our decisions based on available facts rather than independent judgment. And that's also something we're tasked with to do with these bylaws. Right. Chris, I'm sorry. To yes, please. We're, I believe we're missing the page that you referenced. Are we missing it? Did I go too far? Can you just tell us? Chris, what, what policy are you referring We are on uh, standards for board members, ethics, and boardmanship. Policy? 123. 0123. One, it's not included. Yeah. I apologize. Did I go too far? We got the 0122. I went too far. Oh, Next time. Okay. My so, 0122. <laughs> I apologize. So, um, I'll touch on one more and then I won't go any further because I might have gone, cut off more than we can choose. So, um, encourage recognition of the achievements of students and staff and the involvement and support of businesses and community members. That's something that, um, I'm going to talk about it in a minute as well as far as forming committees go. But um, I think we do a good job of recognizing our students. I hope we do a good job recognizing our teachers. We can always do better. And again, we are tasked with doing this. This is a bylaw that we have accepted um, and that we're supposed to be following and focused on. So it's giving us permission to you know, recognize the teachers and students. So uh, more of that can't go wrong, right? That's just some of my thoughts. Um, like I said, we're going to take a little piece of bylaws each month. We'll talk about them. If you have anything that uh, you'd like to discuss on them, please bring them to the meetings. Uh, you know, parliamentary, we can sit here and we can chat about them. I think that more educated, more informed board members are going to make more educated, more informed decisions. Uh, that brings me to committees. Um, so after conducting a thorough review and participating in the strategic plan process, we have identified a long list of committees that are crucial for the progress and future growth of the school system. The majority of these committees will be composed of staff and administration members since they require extensive subject matter and expertise, right? So the strategic plan told us that we needed to come up with a lot of different committees because committees then form actions that we can take, right? Um, and as I said, a lot of these committees are going to comprise of the teachers and the administrators because they're the experts in this subject matter. They know what they're doing, right? But there are a few that we can, as board members, kind of take on that are more in our wheelhouse, right? So the tr strategic plan has presented two opportunities for committees that I feel would best be compromised, comprised of board members and, <clears throat> and committed and knowledgeable community members and stakeholders. 
Um, so the first committee that um, I would like to discuss a little bit, and we're going to bring this up at the next meeting, uh, it'll be on the agenda to vote and organize said committees. Um, so we have the Community Outreach Committee. So there's two of them that the strategic plan really thought we needed to have in place. And these are the ones that the board should be probably chairing and running, right? So we have Community Outreach. So uh, after discussing some of this with uh, Mrs. Collins, we think that the Community Outreach Committee uh, would be tasked with uh, brand awareness, community participation, recommending and participating in key community organizations like uh, the Rotary Club, things like this, like the Horizon Council. Uh, there's a lot of them out there to um, try to, you know, we don't have to be part of them all, but we need to find the key ones that, uh, you know, are the best fit for us, right? Um, attend relevant charitable events and establish opportunities to host community events ourselves. We should probably do it be doing more of that as well. So, uh, The second is the Finance Committee. Um, I think what the Finance Committee should be tasked with doing is finding alternative sources of funding, explore budgetary gaps and establish solutions for those gaps, uh, look for grant availability and procurement. Now these are just a few of the things the committees are going to decide on their own uh, what they need to go after, uh, but these are just some general ideas of what these committees would comprise, right? I feel that uh, with such an exceptional board um, that is comprised of so many professional members with diverse and unique qualifications, we're well suited to tackle both of these committees mentioned. Uh, the strategic plan has presented an opportunity to empower the board to be more purposeful and be decisive in driving the organization forward. Right? So this is the action we can take. We, we sit on the board and we talk about a lot of things, but these are the things that we can now do, right? We're now given permission to go forward and do these things, right? These committees would be tasked with taking a deep dive into the committee topic and finding creative and innovative approaches to reaching the strategic plan goals. Uh, the committee would come up with achievable and measurable plans of action that could be presented to the board. So as a collective body, we could vote and put into action the proposals that have been created. So again, I'd like to open this up for discussion. I'd like you to start thinking about people who might want to chair or, and, or be on said committees. They don't have to be um, necessarily board members. We, we're looking for stakeholders. We're looking for parents. We're looking for business leaders. Uh, they don't even have to be in Cape Coral. They can be anywhere in Florida. So if you're thinking of such people, please bring them to the table and start discussing. But, uh, is there any discussion or any ideas on these committees? Well, I think I think that those are two that you uh, that, that make the most sense for for our kind of a board to be involved in, right? So, uh, it, and it was interesting when we I think in one of the strategic planning sessions, I, I asked the question: Are our principals involved with the chambers of commerce, right? And uh, at, at the time, we hadn't been. We had been a while ago, but we hadn't been recently. But then, you know, I see now pictures of our principals at the Cape Coral Chamber, <laughs> and so, so it was interesting that, like, like overnight, we're, we're now more and more involved. And the more some of those um, entrepreneurs know about us, the more they'd be willing to give either to our foundation or to events that, that we, we need to organize. So I think that's already, uh, become uh, 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 a process that we're, we're beginning to make some, some progress in. And the Finance Committee, I mean, Mark, Mark and team do such a phenomenal job of, here's what you got, but there's always what do we need that we don't have the funding for. And the foundation serves a very important role. Then, of course, Mark's team has a very important role, but then there's always still the gap in between that, that neither can easily solve for. So it, it is really our, our responsibility to identify that and ideally come up with solutions. So I think both of those are, I'm sure there's a, a bunch of others, but those, are, you can only start with, with so much in a given year. That, that's a great place to start. Okay, I appreciate it, thank you. Jackie, would you like to speak on any of the committees? Okay, anybody else? So that brings us to the foundation report. Who's going to be giving that? Okay, you are? Great. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Uh, good 
Good evening, Jen Hoagland, uh, Foundation Treasurer. Um, we have a lot going on in the spring. Uh, this is our favorite time of year. Um, so first, I would like to announce um, that we have our uh, 2024 Lighthouse Award finalists that were announced, and uh, to congratulate them all. Uh, from OEN, we have Alexandra Reddecker. Redecker? Redecker, Redecker sorry. Um, we have Brianna Greg Elysio. Greg Elysio, thank you. <laughs> and Monica Ritz. From OES, we have Viviana Aguilera. We have Lyle Fitzsimmons, and we have Lynette Stockwell. From OMS, we have Christine Christensen, we have Kelly Henry Herbst, and we have Natalie Sheldon. And from OHS, we have Jeffrey Brown, we have Shelby Dahl, and Anna Martin. So congratulations to all our amazing teachers. progressing in the next month with the um, site visits into the classrooms by our volunteers who do those. And then uh, we do have a new date for our um, Lighthouse Award dinner. It has been moved um, because of the conference that I believe administration wants to go to now. Um, so it is going to be Friday, April 5th. And it's still at La Venezia. Luckily, they did have an opening for us. And uh, look for the RSVPs that will be coming through email, push through administration to all the staff, the governing board, as well as city council uh, for that dinner. Um, we have our upcoming um, family putt-putt event coming up on Friday, March the 8th. Um, that is going to be at the Tropical Breeze Fun Park um, up on Pine Island near the bowling alley. Uh, it, this is a full family of uh, fun event. Uh, we have performances by all four schools, uh, theater productions, as well as I think OEN is also doing uh, their course. They're bringing their course too. So we have five, I believe, five performances from all the schools. Uh, and you see how great they all are already uh, with the little ones here from OES. Uh, there'll be a food truck. We have mini golf. There's jelly ball. Uh, our clubs and our sports are opened up if they'd like to do any fundraising activities. They're welcome to do that that night as well to help them raise money for their uh, things. Uh, we're going to be having another online auction as we did last year. This is kind of more school and family based. There's graduation seats, there's OES or OEN, OHS car line um, passes, I believe, VIP. Uh, parking spaces, teachers donate uh, fun events with their students, uh, principal for the day, all that great fun stuff is in this auction, online auction. So look for all of that to be pushed out through the schools, through our foundation Facebook page, and so forth. Um, our OHS scholarships for the high school seniors is going to be open on February 23rd. Uh, that will be pushed out through Oasis High School, and also I believe it always goes out on the guidance page. Um, so, you know, parents, students, uh, look for that for uh, your high school seniors. We have uh, two kinds of scholarships available. One is for um, the academic excellence, and the other is for trade schools as well. And then um, we just closed out our club and sports grants season. Uh, I'm happy to say we have awarded $11,400 this year for all four schools, uh, sports and clubs. Our academic scholarship or ac academic grants are still going on. I think we're doing that still for a whole nother month. Um, to date, we have given $7,300. Um, we did award some this morning, so I'm not going to say yet what's happening because we haven't pushed out those notifications yet. Um, once everything closes for the year, um, we'll give a nice kind of uh, synopsis of some of the wonderful things we've been able to provide to the schools this year. Um, and I think that's all I have for today.
Thank you for that report. We do appreciate it. Thank you. That brings us to our J item 13, staff comment. Do we have any staff comment? No. None seen. Oh, we'll... no, oh. I'm, with you. I'm 14. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll bring us to agenda item 14, unfinished business. 14A is a request for approval for the Adjusted City of Cape Coral um, Employee Ad Pay Codes uh, that we had to update uh, this January. This came from HR Manager. Hello, Chairman Jackson and members of the Governing Board. Thank you for having me. As Ms. Collins just stated, we did um, come to you in April of 2023 to update some of our ad pay codes for the upcoming school year, the school year 25, um, I'm sorry, 24. So we've had to make a few little tweaks. Uh, we went with a rather robust HR payroll system called Tyler Muniz um, just this January. We're still working through some kinks, but we think it's going to be um, a very great program for us to utilize for our HR payroll system. But what we found is that it rounds differently <laughs> than our previous does. So you see a lot of the items in your packet on the ad pay list that are highlighted in blue um, go up or down a penny. So many of those are just you know housekeeping changes, if you will. Um, we did, however, have an internal audit review find something in our practices where we were paying a teacher um, an ad pay rate that was more in line with what we previously identified as a support position um, ad pay rate. Um, we did some research and found that the um, gifted and talented paperwork um, processing historically had been paid at that support rate. So we just wanted to, the recommendation from the internal auditor was to memorialize what our practice had been. So you will see that in green on our ad pay list for changes. Um, while we were diving deep to make sure our internal auditor wasn't going to find anything else, we found something on a, of our own that we had never memorialized before, and that was um, an additional pay that is highlighted in yellow. It is the last item on the list where we um, do have um, a staff person who steps in and does a lot of coaching and development with especially our um, first couple year teachers that are new to the classroom. So we had um, we had been offering her an ad pay to do that and had not been memorialized. So we want to go ahead and self-correct that with your permission. And last but not least, we have a deletion, which is kind of the peachy color, again, on the last page, where some um, safety and security supervisor functions have been absorbed by the city through agreement. So we no longer need to carry that ad pay. So while we were cleaning them up, we were cleaning them all up. So, and that's what I have about ad pays. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Any questions for Ms. Brown? So our recommendation is that the board adopt the updated ad pay schedule. So can I get a motion, a request for approval for the adjusted city of Cape Coral's um, ad pay codes updated January 2024? Motion to approve. Any discussion further? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you. All right, that brings us over to new business. Uh, Ms. Collins, you want to discuss anything on new business? Item 15A is a request for the approval of the Oasis Middle School class size reduction compliance plan this year. And the information that we have is that the class size reduction Hi everybody, Donnie Hopper, principal at Oasis Middle. Just real quick comment about class size. As you know, schools are bound by class size. In uh, our world of middle school, four through eight, um, class size is a 22, and nine through 12, because I have algebra classes offered that is factored into the ninth grade class size, they can be a 25. So, uh, I don't know, maybe middle of last year, the state told us there would not be a penalty for not meeting class size. So with that, I got a little creative with this year's schedule. The state didn't really like my creativity. 
So they've asked for a plan to be written to address why we are over class size. We are over by less than one. So 22 is the number. We looked at it today, I think it's 22.6. Doesn't matter, it is still, how, how low is it, Kevin? 22.4, thank you for remembering. So it's not over by much, but we have to write a plan to say that we will address that. So the penalty is you have to write a plan. They didn't tell us that last year. Um, so we'll get that in place, corrected. It has to be corrected by August of next year when we start. Uh, some things that you can do, you can attach teachers to classes. So using co-teachers in the building uh, is a simple way to do it. The state allows you and statute to do lots of creative things and they tell you to um, send more kids to virtual school to uh, do some things we would never do. So we will address it, it'll be corrected, but this plan had to be submitted to the district and to the state. I was one of like 15 schools in the state that didn't meet class size, so I'm pretty proud of that uh, <laughs> distinction. Sometimes to be the best, you have to do things a little differently. Uh, but we'll fix that for next year. Uh, Mr. Hobb, I do have a question for you. What do we consider is a co-teacher? Co-teacher would be our teachers who are not assigned classes daily. So it could be an interventionist, could be a resource teacher, could be an ESC teacher, could be my dean. Those people can be attached to classes. It is one reason... <coughs> It is a big reason why our elementary schools use and need resource teachers in their building that you might think, why so many people? It helps us meet class size. It is something we've done for a number of years and need to consider as we move forward. So are we going to address the class sizes by putting co-teachers into the classrooms with them? Yes, yeah, so I'll tell you what the, the many schools do throughout the district is they will assign teachers to a class and we have to be careful that they're going into those classrooms. So that's why I did not do it this year. I didn't have the personnel that could actually plug into those rooms, but that's what you'd have to do. Because you wanna make sure if you're saying it's happening, it's happening. What is your plan? Tell them what your plan is. Yeah, the plan is to do that, to attach <laughs> co-teachers and they will go to the room because I wanna do what's expected and actually have it happening. I couldn't pull that off. So I'm one of 15 I feel like in the state that told exactly what's really happening in the building. So we're going to keep 23 students in the classrooms, but add co. So it's the ratio is challenging. I have 25, 26 students in a classroom, not 22. So it's a mathematical equation that not too many people understand. Um, we are looked at on a school-wide basis in a ratio. The district is looked at class by class. So our ratio is a little bit different, and you can end up having 23, 24 students in a classroom and still meet the 22, believe it or not. And what is this co-teacher gonna be responsible for when they're in the classrooms? It's next year, so that's not, <laughs> not planned. Okay. Way too early for that. What do they do, honestly? I mean, are they going to be breaking off the kids in the... You know? Yeah, let me give you two scenarios of what they do. One, management, to manage students and help out with keeping kids on task. Believe it or not, that's an issue. We talk about engagement and keeping students fully engaged. They help with that. And then just what you said, to have that intervention support where students can be seen in small groups as the teacher continues to instruct, or the teacher can pull the small group, the co-teacher can help with the others. Okay, thank you. Any more discussion, questions? Question. We have a question. Do you feel like you got tricked? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I played by the rules. There was no monetary issue. And yes, they, they could have told us, you know, if you don't follow through, this is what you'll get. But that's typical with the state. You get a surprise of, here's how we're gonna do it effective tomorrow. And you didn't know anything. So we'll be fine. I think we're good. Uh, again, super high achieving school. We do get some exceptions because we are, we have a lot of uh, school of excellence and different like recognitions, which is a good thing. Um, and they took away the penalty, which is huge. This could be a $100,000 plus penalty back in the day. So not only would we be paying the fee, you wouldn't have an opening at the middle school for principal, uh, because that's pretty unacceptable. So that we would definitely, we've never been out of compliance in the years that there was a fee associated with it. 
because you just can't. As you stated, Donnie, it, it is one of the most high performing middle schools in all of Florida, probably even the country. So, I mean, we're doing something. Nice. Extra student or not? Do we, do we motion need to approve. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Thank so, you. we have a motion to approve agenda 15A. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any more discussion? Any opposed? Good. All right. Motion carries. That brings us to new business uh, agenda item B. Request for approval for the addition of one Cape Coral Charter School bus driver position to be added to the adoption, adopted budget FY 24 to 26. Yes, hello again, Amy Brown, Human Resources. Um, if you recall, um, we added a bus driver last year, bring our total to, to 19, hoping that that would be sufficient to meet the needs of our daily transportation, of getting our, our lovely kids back and forth. What we are finding, however, is that we um, were not able to do that. So you will recall that we um, did post a substitute bus driver that we could use as needed on call to fill in these gaps when we had absences. Uh, we still have drivers who have COVID. We have one right now with a workers' comp injury. We have a couple who have had um, events in their family that have needed their attention elsewhere. Um, so we've had just struggles to be able to, to maintain our routes. We had in the uh, last week or two had to cancel routes, which of course is very upsetting to the students and their parents. So because we were unsuccessful in finding someone to fill that um, ad hoc as needed on call position, we did reach out to finance to see if there was a possibility of adding a 20th bus driver for the remainder of this school year um, and, go, and you will see in the budget workshop for next year going forward into that year as well. And what we were able to find is that because of the amount of leave time that our bus drivers have utilized, which is all unpaid for them, we do have quite a bit of savings in our budget. So we are able um, to um, hopefully recruit and retain, with your permission, an additional bus driver for this school year. No brainer. So, can I get a motion for agenda item uh, 15B? Motion to approve. Uh, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to now I gotta go new business item C. Ms. Collin? Okay. All right. Uh, this next item is about the Senate proposal that I'm busy waiting with bated breath to hear. Um, I'd like to start my presentation. Before I start, I'd like to let everybody in the room know that this is a proposal that was generated by a lot of time and effort on a lot of people's um, parts. The administrators and I started to meet in end of November, early December, to come up with um, some kind of plan, the Oasis-style plan that we thought we could generate. We couldn't do it on our own because we needed to meet with the finance department to give us guidance and advice on exactly what is there, where it is, is it expendable, is it a reoccurring, reoccurring income source. So we learned a lot about this process and what funds you can pull and take and how funds, when you, when you earmark them for salary, they compound over time. And that compounding is very important to the way you budget. Because if you budget half a million this year, next year it's gonna be three quarters of a million dollars. And the year after that, it's gonna be another million dollars. So we have to be very, very careful how we plan this out. And like I said, I, I'm so grateful to Mark's staff because we met with them multiple times. And we went back and forth with plans and things that didn't work that we wanted to change. And we changed again and we changed again. So I just wanna give you a good understanding of the plan that we have here that, we've presented, that we are presenting to you tonight uh, is, uh, is a lot of hours of effort and um, conversation and name calling, just kidding. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, really, we really work together really well on this, this plan and we're very proud of it. So <clears throat> to begin, this um, graph right here is the longevity bonus that Lee County is offering uh, teachers. It's based on years of service within the district. Finance said, this is something that's doable for us. We can do this on a reoccurring basis. So we can do this every year if we see fit, which we like. 
Um, most of our staff will fall in the first two levels, 10 to 14 years and 15 to 19 years. Um, but as we implement this year over year, we will, we will slowly filter down to the higher levels of, of, of bonuses. Uh, we don't have anybody in our system that has 19 years because we haven't been in existence for 19 years yet. We're currently in year 17, 17.5 to be exact. Um, so, and we're going to fund this longevity bonus this year based on vacancies because we have a lot of savings based on vacancies. The cost to fund this longevity bonus this year is 50,000 and change. Next year, to do the same thing is going to cost us $60,000. That's the compounding effect. Um, Okay. And this is simply, this is just for teachers only. So chart number two, this is the bonus reserve for teachers. Now Mark said, listen, you've got a very limited income um, and your budget is already set for this year. So we are not able this year to find salary increases in addition to what we've already given to our teachers. What we've given is a 1% that we got this year. And we also had a growth allocation from the previous year that we gave them, that we gave teachers. So we're talking about a 2.3% increase already. Am I right about that? Uh, this would be a bonus compensation package in addition to that this year. And this will happen now. So if you work zero to five years, you're gonna get a $1,500 bonus. How many teachers does that affect? 119. And it goes up the chart. If you're year 10 to 14, you're going to get a $2,500 bonus. That's good for 29 of our employees. 15 to 16, we're going down to 8. But at the 17 to 18 plus level, we have 13. Now, this graph was changed from your original presentation. And I'll tell you what I did. The first graph showed 18 plus years of service. Uh, with a $5,500 bonus that would service seven people. I thought we were in year 18 and that we would compensate with that level of, of bonus all the founders, in other words, all the teachers that opened our school system in 2005 for Oasis Elementary South and in 2006 for Oasis Elementary North and the middle school. Now the high school didn't open until 2010. So I reach, I revamped this to include year 17 plus because I thought it was very important that those founding teachers that opened these schools were included in that level of bonus. It was only six additional people, but it doesn't matter. Um, so our cost calculation for this bonus is a half a million dollars. So in a, for, to, give, to give you an example, how this equates to a percentage increase, a teacher making $48,000 with a $2,500 bonus, that equates to a 5.2% increase. These are generalities. Uh, a $58,000 teacher, teacher making $58,000, with a $5,500 bonus, that equates to a 9.5% increase this year. This year. It's a bonus, it's one time, but we need to get the big equivalencies here. Okay. The next chart is the support staff bonuses, also coming out of reserves. These, this bonus is for all of our support staff, food service bus drivers, office, non-instructional certified personnel. We have 77 of these positions that exist. We would like to offer a bonus of $1,500. Now, when we offer these bonuses, we have to remember, um, we have an, a, a, a cost calculation on the backside called fringe. This is all your benefits and everything that goes into these bonuses that we have to pay for. So the cost of this bonus for our 77 positions is $140,000. I'll let this all up for you in the end. Um, if you want to break it down as, a per, uh, as an equivalent percentage increase um, per what you make, for example, if you, your salary is, if your hourly wage is $15 an hour, you've got already in December, you've got a $1,000 bonus. Now you're going to get another $1,500 bonus. So your total amount of bonuses this year for FY24 will be $2,500. That equates to a 12% increase if you're making $15 an hour. If you're making $17.85 like a bus driver and you're receiving the two bonuses together, it, it's the equivalent of a 10% increase. Okay, here's the principal bonus. 
also coming out of reserves, one time. This cost, including fringe, which is on the back end, is, is 53900 and change. It averages about a 5.5% increase for our administrators. It's good. Uh, it's well-deserved. I just wanted to reflect that in Lee County, our administrators are making, those administrators are made an 8% increase to their base salary this year. So I find that a 5.5% increase is sufficient. I mean, it's, it's, it's good work and it's well-deserved. It's not going to be what Lee County is because that's not something we're able to, to maintain. So this graph is very important and I, I, I want to explain this as best I can. I've combined all the bonuses together and it's broken down based on years of service. So for example, if you're an employee with zero years of service in our system, you're getting from reserves a 3% increase. That's the equivalent. Um, if you want to add in the 1% increase that you already got, the equivalent for both of those is about a 4% increase. And then, excuse me, Jerry. Um, and then with your additional, with the, with the bonus that you've already received of $1,000, now you're up to a 6.1% increase. If you want to compare what the salary increases are with Lee County, according to their, their TALB agreement, a person with zero years of experience in employment received a 3.65 longevity bonus. So as we go down the rows, you can see if we add up all the bonuses that our employees are going to get based on years of service, we're not doing too bad. We're pretty much doing, in some instances, we're doing better than what Lee County teachers received this year. In some, not quite as much. Does anybody have any questions about this graph? Because for the board only, uh, we'll, we'll go back to you in a minute. Um, this is just a good equation as to where we are in our bonus level this year versus where Lee County is. Now we're talking bonuses versus this is base salary increase. Is it the same? It's not necessarily the same. But we're basing these, the salary schedule and our bonus schedule, on what our system is able to do. What we're able to do is this right now, go into reserves and pull out almost a million dollars to compensate our staff this year. We are not able at this point to go into our budget and, and give everybody a 6, 7, 12% increase. We don't have it in our budget. We had a 1% increase plus what was already received. This is the OASIS way. If you want to work for OASIS in our charter school system with our limited funds, because Mark Mason always tells us we live on a fixed income, which we do, this is what we can offer this year to our staff. And if you want to do an equivalency for this year, this is what we're going to, this is what we're seeing in general calculations. So, what can we do next year? This year we only have bonus money. Next year, here are some things that we're going to be able to consider. We've already budgeted in a 1% increase. We do that every year for all staff, not just teachers, but I'm talking about teachers right now. We're going to raise all starting salary teachers to $50,000. That, the finance department said, we can afford to do. Is it going to cost us? Mm -hmm. We're also going to be receiving a teacher salary increase allocation, which we do every year. That money is uh, significant. It helps us keep our salaries up where they are, which they will be at $50,000. But there's a growth component, and we're going to need to use that growth component to put towards our veteran teachers who are going to need to pay parity because we're bumping up quite a few teachers to $50,000. A good majority of our hiring salary scale now is 48 and lower. Last year, our tip growth component was about $260,000. That goes a long way. And that goes to your base salary. We don't know what that number is yet this year. We are also budgeted to hire teachers mid-range in that hiring salary schedule. We are also anticipating an increase in FEFP. The Senate and the House don't agree on what that increase is going to be yet, but they will, and we'll know as we go into the year, later this year, March, April, May. So we have some incentives for next year. I can't tell you what these dollar amounts are because we don't know what these amounts are that we'll be receiving. So. As far as base salary increases, this is what we can expect for 
for next year, those final figures will come. As far as what we can do this year, we know for sure that we can offer bonuses across the board to our staff in order to, you know, in order to, to compensate them as best we can. Now, I also wanted to, I also included in my presentation, I just turn this um, This is from the Lee County School District website, and I think this is very important for our teachers and our, and our board to understand. This is the calculator. You can put this in at any time and figure out what your salary is going to be. So this is a brand new starting, starting teacher this year with no years of experience either in Florida or out of Florida. They're going to start at $50,000. We're going to match that. We're matching that. Here's a teacher that has seven years of experience. If you have seven years of Florida public experience, you're going to be making $52,350. Guaranteed, our teachers are already making that. You're a veteran, no. not a new one. No. Uh, thank you for me. No comment back, please. Just hold on, I'm not done yet. If you have 14 years of Florida public experience, you're making 53.1. Plus your pennies. Here's 20 years of Florida experience, you will make 55,135. Here's 20 years of out of the state of Florida experience with no Florida experience. You're still making $55,135. If you have 10 Florida years of experience and then 10 from out of Florida, you're still making $55,135. You see where we're going here? This is if you have 30 years of combined experience. You are making $55,135. Now, the scale ends here. If you have 40 plus years of experience, uh, I think there is something that's negotiable in the county, but they don't publish what that is. So what I'm trying to show the board here is that if our teachers leave and go to Lee County tomorrow or they go next year, the most money they're going to make is $55,135. They're not going to make an 11% increase. They're not going to get a 9% increase, they're not going to get an 8% increase, because that's based on longevity within the system. If you're new to the system and you're going to the county, you're going to make 55135. So our scale is not the differential between what you think would what, what you would make in Lee County and what you're making now is, is not significant. Now Lee County is freezing their hiring salary schedule the 8%, the 11.5% over the course of three years. They're going to stay steady in three, for three years. We are not. We are using our teacher salary allocation money. We're using our 1% increase. So we will continue to rise. We can will have to renegotiate again after three years. But I also want to make it clear to the teachers and the, and the audience that the reason Lee County was able to do this and increase these teacher salaries, which of course were necessary, is they restructured their transportation uh, their bus scheduling, and they, you know, you have to now, you have to go within a school within your, your zone. They say $10,000 a day. Am I right, Mark? Was it something like that? Per school. per school. That's how they came up with the $32 million. It's going to take them for the next three years to sustain that. Then they're going to have to figure out how they're going to, with the compounding effect, to go even higher. So there's a lot of minute detail that goes into Lee County's plan. It looks great on the outside. It looks like if you go to Lee County, you're really going to make it, you know, you're really going to be heads and tails above us. I, I don't necessarily know that if you leave and go, that would be true. From what I can calculate, based on what I see, that is not the case. We are doing the best we can as an OASIS charter school system with what we have. And that's the best we can do. And we have some great... Um, there's some great reasons to be in a charter school system. Uh, there's a lot of creative, creative flexibility in lesson planning, in what you're doing during the day. Um, there's not a lot of bureaucratic overhead that Lee County is seeing, and that is disparaging their teachers and their administrators, and they're, they're leaving. Another component that I want to share with you that Amy Brown is going to explain to you very quickly is the benefits to our insurance package, because there are some benefits um, that we see within our system. Hi again. Um, 
I was asked to put this slide together, on the next three slides, because um, our last meeting in the makerspace, I went over this quickly and verbally, so I thought it would best to illustrate it here on big screen. Um, just some comparisons about our insurance benefits, because as you know, we get our benefits through our relationship with the city of Cape Coral, and our benefits are extraordinary. And thanks to the, the work of our friends at ITSE Hall, we had no increase in our benefits costs for this year. Um, these schools, um, they're on a different plan year. Theirs will come up in March. They're announced if there's not any rate changes coming up for them. But some of the things I wanted to highlight were um, just the sheer um, cost from everyone's paycheck, what their benefits will be. So for, for somebody with single coverage at Oasis, our plans are, there's no contribution required. Um, whereas Lee County, they have three different plans that they offer. Um, it can be from zero to 1390. And I won't read every single number from here, but we think that um, while it kind of goes back and forth a little bit, we in some places we are better, and in some places we are definitely on par with what the, the benefits costs are. Thank you. Dana. Through some of the information that is now required for health plans to publish because of, um, of the Affordable Care Act, it's very easy to compare the, the benefit nuts and bolts, if you will, in terms of what um, insurance product will cover for different medical services. They've all had to come up with like scenarios and use the same things for um, ease and understanding for the consumer. So in the, the plan design documents that are available for OASIS and the School District of Lee County, um, things like a simple fracture for any of you in our, one of our OASIS plans that might only cost you $500 out of pocket for that treatment versus um, the county is about $1,600. Um, so we're better. But if you have type 2 diabetes, maybe your cost at OASIS is a little more than the county. Um, maternity coverage, which we seem to be having quite a few of those are in our program right now. Um, teachers out. Um, significant savings. At, to have a baby if you work for Oasis versus um, at the school district of Lee County. Um, things like x-rays, which are zero copay if you use My Health on site, um, and their partnership with Radiology Regional uh, require 20% coinsurance if, if you're in the district, and that's after you've met your deductible. Um, other advanced imaging, such as um, MRI, again, zero through My Health on site. Um, an MRI can be run you anywhere from 300 to 800, depending on what their MRI is. Um, and then School of Lee County again, 20% after deductible. Um, our generic prescriptions, my health on site, you know, zero. You walk out with them usually. Sometimes they have to set you up the mail order and send them to you, but more often than not, you can walk out with your generic prescriptions um, versus the copay structure that is in all the plans at the School of Lee County. So again, we can't speak highly, you know, high enough about the services we get through my health on site, um, and this is benefit. Please don't. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, um, would you have an opt-out program if you have insurance somewhere else and you um, um, sign the form and give us proof that you have other coverage and you're going to decline our benefits? We give you an $80 a month opt-out payment, which is $960 a year. Um, School District of Lee County does something similar, but it's uh, uh, only $600 a year. Our life insurance is two times your annual salary, round to the next highest thousand. Um, and I would average all of our teacher salaries, so that meant that um, should unfortunately something happen, your family would receive $102,000, but if you worked at Lee County, that's their benefit level is only $20,000. So that's a pretty significant change. Um, and then for insurance eligibility, um, we offer all of our new teachers and incoming staff benefits the first of the month following 30 days of employment um, versus School District of Lee County. Um, they are the first of the month following 45 days of employment. So there is a, another basically month of coverage that they do not even provide for uh, their teachers and their families and their staff's families. So that's kind of a significant um, change to be aware of when you're, you know, possibly looking at other jobs that you might have more months without coverage. Thank you, Ms. Brown. That was very insightful. Very insightful. Thank you. Uh, so go back for a little. Okay. So that, is, that is our presentation to the board um, based on, like I said, a lot of, a lot of um, discussion um, with the finance department. Does the board have any questions about the presentation? Is there anything I can. Or, does anybody have any questions that I can answer? 
sure about any of the charts or anything I've presented so far. Just for now. From a reserves perspective, which does that put our reserves at after this coming out of reserves? Yeah. No general number. It still be more than 10 million. 10 million. Great. Thank you. So the total amount coming out of reserves would be 702,000 inches. Correct. I think it's a microphone. Is it recording? I can speak loudly. I was going to ask the same question about the reserve. I'm glad to hear it's such a high number. But I think the biggest elephant here is you had the one slide about what happens next year. So I like to use examples. You have a teacher who makes $50,000. This year they got a 10% increase total. They're at 55000 If I saw correctly next year, the only thing we know for certain is that they're going to get a 1% raise. So now $50,500. I know we'll try to make up that gap creatively through the budget process, but I just want to—I want to make sure that um, you know every option is on the table because you don't want people thinking, "Oh, I'm now fifty-five thousand dollars, and now I'm going back to fifty thousand five hundred. And I, hearing that there's that much money in the reserves, there may be an opportunity to look creatively again next year once we have all the additional uh, FEFP funding and, and things like that that you mentioned as well. So remember, the, the longevity bonus is reoccurring year after year after year. And they will, they will get that um, indefinitely, as long as they can afford it. Um, I just want to that. The teacher salary allocation growth component is indefinite. They will be getting that, and that will be going towards salaries. It has to. We just don't know the amount. And until that legislation session decides what that amount is, then we can figure out how we Make can that gap up. give it to everybody who yeah, didn't get that large bump at the bottom of the salary range. So that is indefinite. Thank you. Do we have any more board comment? Um, I'd like to thank the finance department and all the staff for racking their brains to try to find this money for our teachers who so deserve this increase. Um, I really wish we could make this more of a, a, a salary increase, but unfortunately the budget for the year has already been established. So we had to think outside the box and come up with creative ways to find this money to give to our teachers. So we're doing it through bonuses. Um, we don't really know where the legislature is going to land with their budget this year uh, with increases in per student funding or if they're going to raise the base rate of salaries. So um, rest assured that we are still going to continue to fight for the teachers. Um, we are it's always top of mind. We understand pay is a disparity for our teachers, um, especially in this system because our budget is smaller than the counties. But um, I hope you can appreciate the work that went into this. I hope you can feel appreciated that we're trying everything we can do to get these raises for you as well. They may not be exactly where the county is at, but we tried to get as close as we could to it as we possibly could. So I hope you can appreciate and see where that goes. All right. Anything further on that? Any more discussion? All right. Yeah, so to approve. Yeah. We're going to ask for a motion to approve new business fifteen uh, C. Request for approval to allocate the reserves in total amount of seven hundred two ninety six, which is to be used for the City of Cape Coral Charter School Authority employee bonuses scheduled for FY twenty twenty four. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Any more conversation? Input? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. All right, that brings us to final board discussion and comments. I'm going to pass the microphone down to our parent reps down there. <clears throat> we always love hearing from you and knowing what's going on from the parents' perspectives. Um, <clears throat> um, I would say, uh, well, first of all, I'm Jose Soto, and I am the um, 
liaison for Oasis Elementary South. Um, you know, in my personal capacity, uh, for the record, you know, I want to state my solidarity uh, with the teachers and their concerns. Um, you know, I have the great honor of spending some time here in the school as a watchdog, and I get a, uh, a glimpse, a very small glimpse, into the day by day that the teachers, you know, have. Um, and it's not easy, you know, what they do for our students and our children. Um, but, you know, even in my uh, official capacity as the liaison, you know, I see that my responsibility is representing the interests of the students. And in representing those interests of the students, then I must consider those of the teachers and educators that are teaching our children. So, you know, I think that it's, you know, in the interest of this board um, to provide clear and relevant information to the teachers. And I think we're doing a really good job at that now. And we just need to continue to do that. Great insight, and thank you for being a watchdog. We do oh, appreciate yeah, no that. Problem. I love that. <laughs> Good. Okay, so Caroline Ruzo for Aries Elementary North. I'm going to second what Mr. Soto said. I am a mother of three, and I can barely handle them. Mm -hmm. So, just the teachers working in the classroom for me is amazing. So, and just looking at the salaries, they're working a lot for what they're getting compensated for. And, and I, I want to applaud you guys for coming forward every single time and stating your point and fighting for you, which is amazing. And I also see that the board uh, is doing a, is trying their best to with bonuses and allocating funds. So I hope that as keep fighting and we keep fighting also on your behalf to get you where you need to be. Yes, that's Gregor for a middle school. I'm a father of three and one in elementary school to a middle school, and I can say they really love to go to school every day. The teachers are doing an awesome job there, and nothing more to say there. Thank you. Um, as the parent rep for the high school, um, that's my, my only one left. Um, I haven't heard any uh, anything really from the high school for the past month and a half. Um, I love um, that Dr. O got that grant and what you guys are going to be doing um, about trying to fulfill STEM teachers and high level positions since that's what kind of the high school is all about is how do you prepare your kids whether they go into a trade, whether they get a job, whether they go to college um, and how hard it is to retain and to get those high level um, educators. Uh, so that is that is fantastic, um, and the conference you guys are going to be going to, I think that's uh, for our generation um, amazing. Um, I know high school, it, it's all about the sports, it's all about the clubs, it's all about getting ready for prom. Um, so there's a lot to kind of look forward to uh, for the spring. I'm just very happy that uh, the strategic planning effort is uh, already resulting in some great new new ideas, processes, and decisions, um, and that, 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 that the staff, along with Mr. Mason's team, did an incredible job to get to this point with, with the salary structure, the bonus structure. So, so just the actions that are being taken, the decisions that are being made, just continue to move us forward. So I'm very appreciative that, that we, we can continue to move forward. So yeah, just to touch base on the teacher salary again, um, you know, as a board, we would love to give everybody what they deserve in pay compensation, which is more than we're getting. Uh, we see that, we know it. Um, as a board, all we can do is we can vote on the budget that's presented to us. This budget is, you know, set. It's it's. The amount of money we get is already predetermined from the legislature. So it's the legislature who actually distributes or allocates this money for the students and for the teachers. So, you know, we're doing what we can on our side to be creative, but it, it ultimately it rests with our legislators on how much they're going to allocate per student and per teacher. 
So um, that being said, yes, we need to do a better job in lobbying them and getting more money for our teachers as well. So, um, that being said, I would like to thank uh, the elementary school for hosting us. Ms. Mary Beth, thank you. It, it takes a lot to rearrange everything. Our city staff to come and set up stuff they're not used to setting up and we're not used to using. So we really do appreciate that and thank you for hosting us today. We love being in the school uh, with the teachers, with the students. We're all happy, so thank you. And again, thank you always to our city uh, staff and cohorts that help us here. The presentation at the beginning was adorable, so whoever was involved in that, that was fantastic. Um, and just going to tell the boy that had to start over that it's amazing regardless. Um, and thanks to everyone that came and spoke today. And just know that we do have your best interest at heart, and we'll do everything that we can with our power. Um, we, it's, we're not blind to the situation, so we're, we're working on it. Um, and uh, that's all. Uh, good evening, everyone. Kathy Stelt. And um, I apologize for not being here at the last board meeting. I, um, I just have to say a couple of things on why I wasn't here, and, and I'll go over that in a second. But regarding of everything that happened this evening, I want to welcome Ms. Metz, so welcome to our board. I did have a, a time to say thank you and welcome, and hello to the board members again, or whoever is still on the board, and our parents as well. So um, moving on, I just want to say, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, EF, Education First. I had the honor to um, be part of something wonderful here in our school. Um, one of our middle school teachers is doing a lead. Um, and what's going on is there's going to be a total of 25 people, 15 students, and 10 parents. And we're going to D.C. this June. We're going on June 8th, coming back on June 13th. And um, EF is Education First, which is really nice. Um, I just have something that I wanted to shout out with this. Um, so it's EF is Educational Tours, provide our students with opportunities beyond the classroom with experiences that bring education to life. EF mission is to provide life-changing education to students and to help them gain new perspectives and to build skills for the future through experimental learning. Um, my goal um, um, is like to get more people involved, including our community, especially our school. Um, I think it's going to be a phenomenal turnout um, if our school can um, talk about what's going on. So it's an all-inclusive trip, and the total price is approximately $2,500. What this entails and includes is everything, including food, room, board, airfare, and all the monuments to um, Arlington Cemetery, to um, most of the museums, um, and, and much more. Even George Washington, too, they're going to say. So it's going to be a really amazing educational experience. And the reason why I'm talking about it is because I'm helping them to um, fundraise. And the goal is to get this 100% paid off. So when we talk about um, teachers' pay and things like that, there's going to be ways that we're going to, as board, we're going to try and find a way to really get you on board and, and get that above all. So we can have opportunities like this where everyone can be involved and get this paid 100%. Um, the next fundraiser is going to be at Big Ten Tavern this um, February 19th. And what I found that I'd like to um, even tell the Foundation Club is that not only do we get a percentage of the meal, but we're allowed to do 50-50 and bring in some Chinese auction. I think that's really interesting because usually when we do these um, meals, you only get a percentage, where some of the um, locals are reaching out and doing more. So this way you'll get more in your pocket. So December 12th at our last meeting, I was at a quarter auction, I was helping the students raise some money we did raise over $2,500, so it's going to offset the kids' um, fun for their trip, and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and that's about it. So, does staff have any final comments they'd like to make? You guys did a great job. Yeah. <laughs> great. That ends final board comments and discussions. Um, Move on to 17, uh, which is the best part of the agenda for most people.
The next regular governing board meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 12, 2024 at 5.30 p.m. And that'll be at City Council Chambers. And uh, just a reminder, we will be shadowed with the council as well. That being said, meeting adjourned.